Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we are doing episode number 23 uh, on the topic of heaven. If you have not seen the first 22 episodes, please go to my YouTube channel, uh, Sin City Preacher. All of the previous episodes are available. Uh, each episode is two hours long, so uh, so far we've talked about heaven for 44 hours. <laughs> we are getting near the end now, though. But uh, uh, we've we've had a great time talking about heaven because it's such a, a, a joyful, positive subject to, to discuss. Uh, Paul says, whatever is good and pure and lovely and good report, think in these things. Well, what could be better to think about than heaven? So we spent 44 hours talking about it, uh, and most people are probably surprised that uh, there's so much to be said and learned about heaven. Uh, so um, we're using Randy Alcorn's book uh, titled Heaven kind of as our guide, study guide, uh, and we're going through his book, uh, reading his uh, comments and then discussing them and answering the questions that he poses. But before we get into the material here, I'd like the panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, let's uh, start with uh, Brother Austin. Hey, sorry guys, sorry, I was unloading the dishes. Um, Hey everybody, how you doing? This is uh, Austin. My channel's name here is Austin Bell. I do an online ministry here called Christ Ministries. Uh, glad to be here, and Jesus is risen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, brother. Okay, <laughs> brother Eric. Hi everybody, Jesus Night Seventy Two. Uh, thanks for joining us today, uh, Resurrection Day. Um, he is risen, and uh, Hopefully you can share all the joy in this study that we've gotten uh, from sharing this with each other in our discussion of heaven. Amen. And Brother Jackson. Hi there, everyone. This is Mecca Wing Zero Jackson here. And I'm. Uh, this has been a great study, this whole thing with heaven, but I'm, I'm kind of curious about the next topic here, too. Well, so I'm wondering, I'll, I'll, I'll wondering what, what episode is this again? Uh, this is number 23. Number we'll, uh, we'll have a couple of more before we finish up heaven, and then the next uh, uh, topic is really a, a, basically a different kind of format. Uh, it, this is reminding me a little bit of Between the Lions cliffhanger, little little clips. Do you remember that? <laughs> no, I don't know that. But you don't have to look that up afterwards because it's like cliffhanger. This is book number one hundred and forty-seven, or some ridiculous number like that would keep coming. Yeah. Little stories. Well, I, I'm glad you actually brought the subject up because once we're finished with the topic of heaven, the, the new subject will be uh, uh, any subject. Uh, any question that someone wants to send us or any question that the panelists uh, decide that they want to pose to the panel, uh, we will uh, be ready with an answer. And that will be the theme of the show, ready with an answer. Uh, however, uh, it, I, I think that it's going to be uh, very, very interesting to do it but I believe it could also be very hazardous because whenever you dare to give an answer, <laughs> you're going to find some people that like your answer and some people who hate your answer. So uh, if, you, if you dare to participate in the discussion uh, at that time, be, be warned that you probably will be making some enemies. Okay. okay. That's kind of like a trailer, sort of like, like a trailer for um, a reality show coming up. <laughs> yes, okay. Thank you, Brother Jackson, for saying that, and uh, I hope that does stimulate everybody's curiosity. And, and anybody who does watch these videos, uh, please send your questions in to me uh, uh, as soon as possible, any theological questions you have. I will compile a list, and then when we're ready to get into the, uh, the program, ready with the answer, uh, we'll, we'll be looking at all your questions. Okay, for now, we're starting Chapter 32 of Randy Elkhorn's book, Heaven. and one of the things that we like about his book is that he uh, starts each chapter with a question, and then there's follow-up questions throughout the chapter. And the question in chapter 32 is, what will we know and learn in heaven? Uh, he says, it's common to hear people say, uh, we don't understand now, but in heaven we'll know everything. One writer says that people in heaven can easily comprehend divine mysteries. Is this true? Will we really know everything in heaven? 
So before we get into Randy Alcorn's answers to these questions, let me see what the panelists have to say about this. Uh, I'll start off. Uh, my quick answer to that question is no, we won't know everything. Um, I think one of the big joys of heaven, and we've talked about that several times here already, is that heaven and heaven in and of itself, the new earth and eternity uh, is going to be a constant state of learning and discovery. So clearly we won't know everything or else there'd be no expectation of anything new. So um, to me, no, I don't think we will know anything. Not, not only that, but God is the only one who is omniscient. He's the only one who is all-knowing. Um, not only that, we have actual proof that just because you're in heaven you don't know anything. The the um, Those who are in heaven in Revelation, I could be paraphrasing this wrong, but uh, I believe they are asking questions of God at that time. How long, O oh Lord, before uh, their blood is avenged? Uh, they're asked that question. They didn't know, clearly. They didn't know the answer to that question and other things. So I think that's a pretty, pretty easy question to answer. Yeah, I, I think you, you give a very good answer. One, of course, is that God is the only one that's omniscient and that does know everything and, and that will know everything. Uh, but you, I like how you referenced the scriptures to show that even in heaven right now, um, uh, the, the people in heaven now are not omniscient. They don't, you don't die, go to heaven, and all of a sudden you know everything. Uh, right. that, that is a characteristic or a, a quality or attribute of God, omniscience, right. but not for us. Uh, you guys want to say anything about that before we go on? I just agree with Eric totally with what he said there. I, I think there's great joy in learning, and God created us to be that way. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and the, there's a song uh, that after we've been there ten thousand years, it'll be just like we've been there the very first day. And and I'm thinking, well, after ten thousand years of more learning. Uh, I should feel like I know it all, you know, but but even then we're not going to know it all. Ten thousand years, or or ten thousand billion years, we're never going to know it all. But it's I'm looking forward to the excitement of learning uh, throughout eternity. I don't know. Uh, to me, I, I didn't care much about learning so much when I was a young man. Uh, after I finished college, though, and I I found subjects that I were particularly interesting to me, and I, I did into my own independent study on them. I enjoyed studying because there's a topic that's interesting to me instead of me just being required to learn it for an education. So I, uh, I think when you're uh, learning something that you find really interesting that you're going to really enjoy it. Okay, he, uh, he next asks, will we know everything? God alone is omniscient. When we die, we'll see things far more clearly, and we'll know much more than we do now, but we'll never know everything. The Apostle Paul wrote, quote, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, the italics words are based on two different Greek words, gnosko and epi, epic gnosko. The prefix epi int intensifies the word to mean to really know or to know extensively. However, when the word is used of humans, it never means absolute knowledge. Uh, so, well, let's look at this verse here. Uh, he says, uh, now I know in part, then I will know fully. Uh, you can take a, you can see how some people would take that verse there and think that it means that we will become omniscient, can't you? Okay. Um, in his systematic theology, Wayne Grudem says, First Corinthians three twelve does not say that we will be omniscient or know everything. Paul could have said we will know all things. Uh, that's ta panta, uh, if he had wished to do so. But rightly translated, it simply says that we will know in a fuller or more intensive way, even as we have been known, that is, without any error or misconceptions in our knowledge. Misconceptions, yeah. I'd like to know things without 
even though you don't know everything, the things you do know, there are not misconceptions in it. I think that's a better way to describe it. That that's the best. That's the best way to describe it. And I think as far as as far as the question you had before, as far as Paul's reference in First Corinthians, I think he's really talking about. In our lives now, I, I think in context of what he's saying, if you go back and look at that in Scripture, I think he's more talking about our relationship to, in, uh, with God. We know God as well as we can possibly know him in these people that we are. We'll, we'll fully know him in a personal, face-to-face -face relationship, and I think that's what Paul's referring to as far as fully knowing um, at that point in Scripture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh I, I look forward to being able to know something cl with clarity, without any any confusion, or making sure that what I do know is is true. Uh, because, I, yeah, go ahead. So say, I think what's very important is to realize how flexible the words "know" and "knowledge" are. This is something people get wrong, I think, a lot. Because there's, on one hand, we all know God as saved people. On the other hand, there's a fellowship knowledge that comes in different degrees, like 1 John 2, 3 says, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Out of context, a lot of people, in my experience, who have come across like to use that verse to try to say, see, you have to, know, you have to keep the commandments to be saved, but really that's quite a, a weak interpretation if you read the whole chapter, because knowledge there is clearly in a fellowship sort of sense, and we're going to experience a knowledge of God, a in, in the flexible term in heaven that we've never experienced before, and um, and and so so I think like in most conversations, defining our terms here is critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good point. I'm moving on to this next page here, and the question is, will we learn? Uh, I heard a pastor say, uh, "There will be no more learning in heaven." One writer says that in heaven, activities such as investigation, comprehending, and probing will never be necessary. Our understanding will be complete. In a Gallup poll of people's perspectives about heaven, only 18% thought people would, would grow intellectually in heaven. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that to me is very concerning that people feel that way because I really feel the exact opposite of that. I think we're never we're not going to truly learn uh, until we get there because you know you're always limited by your failings as a human being you're always limited by even our even with sin in us our, our ability our inability to retain everything we do learn we forget things we I mean in heaven you're dealing in a situation where what we don't know will be learning and what we learn will always retain that's pretty cool. I mean, especially for a person who maybe is dealing with issues like you see people in your family who are dealing with Alzheimer's or things like that where they're losing even who they are and, and their memories of the people they know and love. Um, you never have to worry about that in heaven. Anything you learn in heaven with God, this, these things are always going to be retained. Never go away. Okay, Amen. Very good point. Um. Yeah, the memory, we've talked about memory in the past, that when we go to heaven, will we retain the memories from our lives here on earth? And uh, we've had some good discussions on that, and now you talk about memory in terms of the things we learn in eternity will be retained. We'll never have loss of, of memory or forget things, which is, that's a very interesting uh, point, and I, I look forward to that. I think a lot of people look forward to that. <laughs> Absolutely. I know I do. <laughs> Okay, does scripture indicate that we will learn in heaven? Yes. Consider Ephesians 2, 6 through 7. God raised us up with Christ and see this with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, unquote. The show means to reveal. The phrase, in the coming age, ages, clearly indicates this will be a progressive, ongoing revelation in which we will learn more and more about God's grace. Hmm. How does that scripture, uh, does that scripture satisfy you to make that case? Yeah, I think it definitely supports that. Um... His use of reveal here, absolutely, through different through revealings of all sorts of things. That's learning. It's teaching. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's so uh, it's so key here to realize what is black and white and what is gray here. 
Like, either you have eternal life or you don't. That's black and white. Knowledge is the epitome of, like, a grayscale that I, uh, system, I think, that just keeps growing and growing and growing. And I would argue, since heaven is eternal, we'll never be totally omniscient. Yeah. Yeah, I guess knowledge, you not only have uh, 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 the, the quantitative um, um, part of, of a knowledge, how much you know, uh, you have the, the qualitative, which is the, the, the uh, how correct are you. Uh, so it is a uh, more of a, uh, what was the way you phrased it, uh, Jackson? The, it's a great scale system. It's a what? You know, grayscale is like yeah, a gray. color type for, for photographs, where they have a bunch of different shades of gray, all the way from black to white. So I'm right. saying sort of like that kind of scale with our knowledge. Yeah, yeah knowledge is much more looking to, to the degrees of knowledge. Uh, we ne never have, com we'll have complete knowledge, but the degree of knowledge will, will grow. Um, remember what we were ta talking about, remembering things? This is a perfect example. I just forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'm moving on to the next uh, question that says, uh, will we experience process? The first humans lived in process as God ordained them to. Adam knew more a week after he was created than he did on his first day. Nothing is wrong with process and the limitations it implies. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, Luke chapter 2. Jesus learned obedience, Hebrews chapter 5. Growing and learning cannot be bad. The sinless Son of God experienced them. They are simply part of being human. Unless we cease to be human after our resurrection, we will go on growing and learning. If anything, sin makes us less human. When the parasite of sin is removed, full humanity will be restored and improved. So this process, he's talked about in past chapters about continuity, uh, and, and now he's talking about process, which I think are two principles that I think that are really important for us to, to get, to, to, to comprehend, that uh, uh, things of the past will continue, like, okay, the earth, there will be a, a new earth. We had an old earth, this could be a new earth. We had old bodies, but we'll have new glorified bodies. We'll, we have uh, memories and activities, we'll have memories of those. There will be continuity. I have my identity of who I am, and every, that identity will, will continue. I'm not going to be a person. Uh, and then there's, there's that continuity. And then he talks about process, but there's this ongoing process of building, of growing in, in our knowledge. So um, uh, we were talking earlier about the fact that so few people think that we're going, only like 18 percent of people think that they're going to be learning in heaven. And I think this is just another thing that we can add to our list of, of common misconceptions about heaven, that, that the general population has really very little knowledge and idea of what heaven is going to be like. That's very unfortunate. Hey. Brothers, I just want to say, God bless you. I, I have to get out of here. I'm going to cut it short today. But I want to say a, uh, happy Easter. Um, God bless. Thank God that Jesus Christ rose again. And um, I pray this study goes good for you guys today. Thank you, brother. Talk to you later. God bless, God bless Austin. And, God bless. But and make sure to call or text me later, okay? I will, Brother Jackson. You all have a blessed day. Okay. You too. Bye. Bye. One of the – real quick, uh, something you said, Luke, is a great word you use there. And if we really take a step back and – to take a look for the, you know, at the forest for the trees. Continuity is something God shows in everything. And this is from the dawn of creation. This is from the beginning. Um, God showed continuity in, uh, in his design for creation, how the world functions, all things that are designed separate, yet they work together for a continuity that keeps the earth working in the way it does. The universe, in and of itself, God tells us we can use the things in the universe, the stars, the planets, the things of that nature, for signs and for timepieces. This is also continuity. You know, um, and this is outside just the realm of what we know as our physical creation that we're kind of bound to as human beings. Um, I think it's realistic to assume that 
that this is something God is going to continue to do. Continuity is going to be something He's going to He's going to He's going to keep going, um, because it was put in place prior to all these things falling apart, and so it seems only logical that it's going to continue in eternity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Then the next question uh, Randy has is, what will it be like to learn? Uh, could God impart knowledge so we immediately know things when we get to heaven? Certainly. Adam and Eve didn't go to school. They were created, it appears, with an initial vocabulary. But Adam and Eve are the exceptions. Every other person has learned by experience and study over time. And Adam and Eve were learners the rest of their lives. Nothing ever came automatically again. When we enter heaven, we'll presumably begin with the knowledge we had at the time of our death. God may enhance our knowledge and will correct countless wrong perceptions. I imagine he'll reveal many things to us, then set us on a course of continual learning, paralleling Adam's and Eve's. Uh, once we're in resurrection bodies with resurrected brains, our capacity to learn may increase. Perhaps angel guardians or loved ones already in heaven will be assigned to tutor and orient us. <laughs> well, that's uh, interesting uh, that uh, he thinks that uh, at the instant we're in heaven, we may be, be instantly bestowed with some more clarity and understanding on certain things. Uh, and then, but then after that, it's going to be a process of learning. That's a possibility. Uh, I would. I mean, to me, it, it's. I don't know uh, what he's basing it on, but it, it seems to fit to me with everything we understand about heaven in our study up to this point. That that somehow uh, God's going to reveal thing some things to us so that we we maybe get the answers that you know that we need immediately, uh, and then after that uh, we have not a lifetime of learning, but an eternity of learning and, and going through this process of learning and growing. I wonder too if we'll be learning from each other as well as from God. Like right now we're learning from each other as we talk to each other and everything like that. I suspect we will. Uh, I, and I suspect It's kind of weird because you know God's omniscient and obviously we aren't and everything but I wonder if he'll use us to teach things to each other still. I don't. I can't really back it up, but I, I do think that because uh, we are going to be interacting, uh, we'll be talking about this more as we go along in this book here. But um, there's going to be a lot of interacting be, uh, between us, and I, I I can't imagine that uh, I, if I had a chance to meet somebody uh, that I really wanted to meet, like the Apostle Paul or John or any any of these heroes of the scriptures that uh, I wouldn't want to spend some time and ask them some questions and learn from them and, and maybe have, have them clarify some things for me. And uh, uh, I, I just I don't think that all of our learning will just going to be revelation from God in eternity. I'd be surprised by that. I don't, I don't think so either. I'll tell you why I think so is because part of that whole thing is of interacting with, for instance, you use the example of the apostles. Um, we talked a little bit about our loved ones, things of that nature. Um, that's that's the whole human interaction. I mean, God made that interaction for a purpose. So he 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 wanted us to have it's another fe it's a fellowship. So I mean, it seems only right to me that that would be something that would continue in fellowship among other you know uh, you know one person to another person. That's part of love. It's part of learning. It's part of fellowship. It's part of it's part of brotherhood. Um, I, I think they all tie together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm 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 really looking forward to having uh, Byron Nelson uh, help me with my golf swing, kind of detail. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, we'll skip a few pages here, Eric, uh, until it says, "Will we find books in heaven?" Uh, we know that 66 books, those that comprise the Bible, will be in heaven. Quote, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens, unquote. So uh, uh, we know that, that those that book will be there. 
uh, is it wrong to think maybe that there might be some other books of great great writings of uh, uh, maybe Shakespeare's writings or uh, you know, uh, people who have written great stories that uh, the stories that we love uh, will those books still exist uh, is there any reason for them to exist And what I about think they will because because a, a man wrote those books and he was obviously a, a man in this world there's probably as mild as it is some tint of sin somewhere in those books yeah there is in media everywhere today and stuff mm-hmm hmm well I'm wondering though if, if, let's say we read we read a book and, and, and within the story of that book was uh, something that you know obviously we can see as sinful and that we would God wouldn't approve of we don't want to approve of it either and yet uh, it, it's just part of the story does that does that mean that because the storyline has some sin in it that that uh, we we cannot even think about that There's no I, I, I don't think that at all it's just that um, I, in fact I'm not talking necessarily about like I don't know things that a movie rating would go up for, but think about all the bad lessons that movies often teach and, and books often teach. Like the some someone it'll, it'll you know, try to justify someone's bad behavior. Like e even the Little Mermaid, I remember my parents threw away that movie. <laughs> kind of oh just she kind of rebels against her parents and it turns out great, so to speak, or something. There's no, a, but you know, but you know what? Example, but you, you but see you, what I'm saying, at least. Well, well, yeah, you can, but you, but the same thing could be said about about the Bible. There are stories in the Bible about all sorts of people doing things wrong in the Bible. So, but it's, um, but it's not condoning them ever in the Bible. No, and and that's, but bad, wait a minute, but the um, but in those stories, those stories aren't necessarily condoning that behavior. In fact, they're show, In fact, they show what happens in the destructive part of the rebellious behavior that the person has. So, I mean, I, I think I, I could go either. I see your point though, Jackson, and I, and it's well taken because I could see both sides of the argument there. Um, to me, I kind of look more forward, saying, well, there would be new books to write, you know. Yeah. But at the same time. At the same time, you know, some of these books and some of these literary literary works are a history of mankind in a way. You know, they they're sort of the story of us. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, I don't know if God holds a special place for the imagination of man and what he penned and what he put together. Um, I'm sure certain works, like along the lines of what Jackson was saying, I'm sure certain works, of course, would take precedent over whether it would be there or not over other works. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but that's a great question. I I don't know. I I've, I've actually never heard that question before. I've never thought of that. Well, I would like to ask about uh, not only about this question of the the, the books that Randy's referring to here, the sixty six books, the, the the Bible, the canon, but also the when in Revelation it talks about the books will be opened, uh, and the, you've got the Lamb's Book of Life, you've got the Book of Life, you've got the books will be opened. Mm -hmm. All these references to books. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm wondering if those books will be be uh, retained or not. Uh, you got the Book of Life is a, a record of every person that's ever been born, and when we're blotted out of the Book of Life, that means you die and you didn't get eternal life. Uh, and, and you didn't receive eternal life by by getting in the Lamb Book of Life. So you're blotted out of the Book of Life, uh, uh, and then the Book of the books. I think that when it says the books will be open, everything will be revealed. I think that's a, a personal book for every person, where it's a record of their life. Uh, I don't know if I'm correct in all that, but uh, uh, if that's the case, I wonder if those books will be retained too. If there's any reason to to retain them or not, uh, or if uh, uh, you know, he says our sins and iniquities he will remember no more. He'll cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. So maybe. The record of our lives and the sin and stuff in our lives will be won't be in heaven. And, and that's I think that's a reasonable question too. That that's a definitely a possibility that that's sort of like wiped clean and you get a clean slate, so to speak. <laughs> so uh, nobody seems to think that like Shakespeare and other writings uh, will uh, likely be retained. I'm not sure. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. I think that there's probably. Uh, Maybe God inspired Shakespeare and some great writers. That it's not, it's not, uh, you know, 
uh, scripture, but it, and yet uh, it, maybe God inspired them to write a story that's wonderful and we're supposed to learn from it. So maybe some of these things will be retained, I don't know. Uh, but my question now is, because uh, you know, I always like to open up a can of worms, uh, when Randy's talking about the, the, the Bible, the verses that says that uh, the Bible will be retained, uh, what was that? I already skipped ahead a few pages. Um, uh, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands forever. So we, we, we believe then that the Bible itself will be retained and, and uh, last forever. But then the, will, will we be surprised and find out the, what the Bible is? Will we, will we be saying, hey, it, it is the 66 books, the 39 books in the Old Testament, the 27 books in the New Testament, the 66 that are accepted as canonical today, ah, they, were, they got it right, those are the scriptures, that's the Bible. <laughs> or maybe we'll find, or is it possible we may find the Roman Catholics had, had it right and there's some of their books, they have like 10 other books that they accept as canon. Maybe some of those we'll, we'll find are, are uh, re retained. Uh, maybe some of the books that nobody accepts will be retained. Maybe some of the books that we do ex accept today as part of the canon, we'll find out they're not in it. Well, what do you think about all that? I think that's a, um, I think that's a really thought-provoking question. I think it's something that I think a lot of Christians are going to be very quick to shoot down the idea of such a question. But I would ask them to be hesitant in that regard because, you know, don't be so quick... Uh, to judge a situation. Um, th the best way I can answer that question is um, clearly God knows what he considers to be his official word. Um, if something was, say, mis mistakenly included or mistakenly taken away, um, we're definitely going to find out. He's definitely going to let us know that. Um, I, I would think that'd be one of the one of the chief things we would come to find out from God is is to say, look, you know, you were trying to follow this all along, but this really wasn't supposed to be there, or or you should have been following this, and this wasn't there. I think I think those are things that, and I know people get, you know, I'm going to bring this up now because it is a big topic, and there is this back and forth battles that go on back and forth between Christians, and it's really got to stop. Um, the idea of of questioning such things, um. To say, look, maybe I don't necessarily trust with all they included, or maybe something else should have been included, or, or, I mean, it's impossible for us to go in a time machine and know for sure. So, the 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 idea should be, you know, the great the question, which is the tr the real question is what is truth, what is truly God's word, and in a search to understand what really is his truth, you need to be willing to accept you may be wrong about certain things. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a humility thing. You have to be willing to say, look, I'm not doing this to discredit the Bible or, or anything like that. And I know people are going to think that. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to be sure that this is what God intends. This is truly what he wants, and this is truly what he wants us to know. And that's what the real question is, and what we should really care about. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if we think that Randy's reference to that verse... Uh, uh oh I, might, I got my fan on it. It's blowing all kinds of pages. <laughs> We were somewhere around 325, uh, between 322 or 320, somewhere in that area, three in the 320s. Okay. You were you were at the. What was the verse? Can you read that verse again about uh, his word will be retained? Oh, um, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. That's Psalm 119:89. Okay. Jesus so said, "Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word." My words will never pass away. Okay, so if we accept that his um, his word that's referring to here are the scriptures, then mm -hmm. we're gonna, I guess we're going to find out when we get in heaven uh, what he considered to be the scriptures. Absolutely, I, I would say a hundred percent. Absolutely, he would want us to know that. Yeah, Jackson, do you want to comment on that? Um, I would just say that I'd be very slow 
to uh, to to do anything that changes the Bible the way we have it. I mean, I'm not saying what Eric said is totally invalid. I do think we should examine all the evidence and everything. But let's as soon as you get hasty with throwing things out, you know, I mean, the extreme example is the Mormons who they'll just always say illogical things like, well, that scripture isn't correctly translated, even though they have no Greek, no scholarship, no um, no anything to support that. It just doesn't go with their doctrine. Right. Um, they got outside of the Bible. So let's be very careful to avoid that as well. In this. Oh, no, amen, Jackson. You're absolutely right. Haste is never something. And that's kind of what I was trying to... Uh, 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 kind of move towards to say it's something that should be considered with all thought, with all prayer, uh, and and asking God, the Holy Spirit, to to uh, you know impart in you that wisdom to um, uh, you know to to help you discern uh, what is proper, what isn't. I think what it comes down to the the question that Luke is saying, you know, if there is something wrong. And I think as human beings, we have to be willing to always say, hey, we've touched something. There's a chance something can be wrong. Um, we're involved. So so we have to be humble enough to say that. Um, his word, what is his word, of course, will always endure, will always continue, will always be preserved. I, I think we absolutely – God would want us above all things to be clear about what we believe, about what he considers his word. So to me, there's no question in my mind, Luke. The answer to the question is, is if God has a problem with anything not being in there or being in there, he's definitely going to let us know. Because this is something, to me, that would be uh, um, something of great import to God. He definitely wants us to uh, have, have the knowledge of Scripture that he intends for us to have. So he's definitely going to show us what he would consider to be right or wrong in that regard. Yeah. Now, we, we all agree. We call this the Word of God. Amen. And uh, we, we all agree, this is the Word of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and so if, if this verse is saying that His Word endures forever, then when, what we find out in, when we get to heaven that is considered His Word, we'll find out what it really is. Yes. If, right. if, and maybe if, if we got it right or if we got it wrong. I mean, the thing is, the, the thing too is, for anyone uh you you've got to you got to read everything the bible says in context too and everything you know mm -hmm. like uh, that's sometimes twisting verses out of context is actually how people will will add things to the bible is they'll twist something out of context as they see it's not really saying not to add oh, oh yeah i mean contextual suicide is really one of the worst you know of, of crimes right. out there right now as far as the bible is concerned in many ways depending on different false doctrines but i'm talking specifically about in terms of adding or taking away from the bible absolutely they, things that are indisputably the Bible, like the Gospel of John and all that, and they'll twist something out of context to include things that aren't there and everything. Well, yeah. I'm just, I'm just pro proposing this. When we, when we get to heaven and his word endures forever, if, if he has it in a written form as, as we have it, and we get to look at it, we're going to find out if, if we got it right or not with this canon. That's all. Okay. Uh, we're moving to chapter 33, and uh, the question is, what will our daily lives be like? Uh, one question is, will we rest? When God created the world, he rested on the seventh day, that's Genesis chapter 2. That's the basis for the biblical Sabbath, when all people and animals rested, after this chapter 20. God set aside days and weeks of rest, and he even tested the earth itself. Well, he even, even rested the earth itself every seventh year, Leviticus chapter 25. This is the rest we can anticipate on the new earth, times of joyful praise and relaxed fellowship. Our lives in heaven will include rest, Hebrews chapter 4. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them, Revelation chapter 14. Well, before he, he's going to go into this much more thoroughly, but um, the question is, will there be any reason, any need for us to rest? 
well, we need rest. I mean, we're going to have different glorified bodies. Well, we have to go to sleep and rec 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 have our bodies recover for with eight hours of sleep a day. Or, well, we need to work hard. All of a sudden, we get tired. We've got to sit down and rest. I think one of the problems with that is preconceived ideas people get about why we rest. Um, there's, uh, for instance, God rested on the seventh day, and um, but we know God doesn't get tired. He doesn't get sweaty and you know he doesn't get tired. He, um, but the period of rest, uh, of course, we need a period of rest because it gives us those moments to kind of take a step back and enjoy the labor, the fruit of our labor. Um, the, the, uh, to um, enjoy what we've been working for that whole time, to, to, to rest in enjoyment of it, instead of the rest in the building it and constructing it and working at it. It gives us a chance to kind of take a step back and just kind of soak up what we've done and what we do, uh, it, that kind of a rest, just, just a, a, an enjoyment of what's been done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Jackson? I, Will there be a need for rest? I think it's kind of a best of all worlds situation in heaven, meaning that there is something pleasurable about resting, but there's also, you know, like an innocence if you if you can't complete a job or something like that. So I would say there won't be a need for it, but there will be the benefits of it. Yeah, very interesting. Hey, Eric, how did Jackson get to be so wise at such a young age? Uh, I guess the Holy Spirit's given him wisdom, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it says, make every effort to enter that rest, Hebrews chapter 4. It's ironic that it takes such effort to set aside time for rest, but it does. For me and, many, and for many of us, it's difficult to guard our schedules, but it's worth it. The day of rest points us to heaven. And to Jesus, who said, "Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest." Uh, I think I'm going to take exception with him using Hebrews 4:11 on this to make this case, though, because uh, d d we're talking about bodily rest, and uh, and uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. I, I don't think that's referring to bodily rest. Do you? No, I don't. I don't think he's talking about a, a bodily rest in that regard. Well, how do you see Hebrews four eleven and, uh, and this, what kind of rest is it referring to? I mean, uh, see if you agree with my thoughts on it. Hebrews, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I'd have to go back to Hebrews. I want to get the context that it's written in before I. Let's see if Jackson has an idea on it while you're looking it up. Uh, my initial my initial reaction is no, but I admit I'd have to read that whole chapter and everything because well, if you if you look at the context of Hebrew as a as a book itself, it's it's all talking. Of, the whole point is uh, uh, let's rest. Except the fact that Jesus said it's finished. You don't have to be religious and do the sacrifices anymore. You don't have to you don't have to follow Judaism. You don't have to uh, do the do do the uh, Jewish sacrifices. You can rest in Jesus. He finished the work. Well, it's interesting how there is a dual concept going here, because on one hand, we are called to serve the Lord, and God rewards us for our service and everything, but on the other hand, our salvation is never in jeopardy, so we can rest. No matter how bad I fail, no matter how extreme I fail, my salvation is secure. So the incentive of, of works and service should be gratitude and, and joy and rewards and all that stuff. So I'd yeah. say there's a simultaneous working and resting coexisting there, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, but I, I think the resting he's referring to in Hebrews and what Luke's talking about is um, this is about entering entering into the rest based on our salvation through our faith in Christ. Uh -huh. um, and that's really what Hebrews is building on when you look at the context at the beginning of the chapter. It's it, And this is, again, Jackson, it's so funny. You were just talking about context. You, know, you keep everything in context. It's important to not pluck something out, even if you're – Intentions are good, and I understood the intention behind what Randy was trying to do here, but really in that application, it's really talking about going into your rest in Christ. It's talking about uh, entering, because in chapter in chapter 4, verse 3, we, we see it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. He's talking about all the things G Christ has accomplished already and that's the rest we need to enter into. 
yeah. into the rest of what he's done on our behalf. I, I, it's very easy. I know as, as much as I like what Randy's done with this book in heaven, uh, you know, I, I think in a few cases like this one here, he's done what you said, Eric, is that you can't just, you can't just get a concordance, look up the word rest, and find every verse that refers to rest and try to use it for your purpose because in the context this verse is not talking about resting from our labors uh, you know it, it, it's talk, getting bodily rest and sleep that kind of a thing it's talking about resting in the promise of Jesus statement it's finished yes. salvation is I've, I've accomplished it for you you don't need to try to do it yourself just rest in my arms I'll, I'll, I'm going to save you if you just rest in me so uh, yeah, you know, I, I know I've I've uh, prepared a lot of Bible studies over the years, and I you know used a concordance and find the word I want to discuss and all the references to it. And it, sometimes it's tempting to want to use a verse that, uh, that says something like he's doing here, but it's really not what it says. It means in context. Uh, you now. Uh, that was a good catch, by the way. I just wanted to give you kudos for that, Luke. That was a good catch. That was... yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. He, he goes on to say, God rested on the seventh day before sin entered the world. He prescribed rest for sinless Adam and Eve, and he prescribed it for those under the curse of sin. Regular rest will be part of the life to come in the new universe. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be wise to learn how to rest now? Um, well, I, I think uh, in, next he asks, will we sleep? So this is really, really being in the context of kind of laborious physical type of labor. Is it going to be necessary for our bodies to recover? Will we need to rest and sleep to, so our bodies can recover? Uh, that's the question. Uh, he says, if our lives on the new earth will be restful, uh, will we need uh, to sleep? Some people argue that we won't sleep because we'll have perfect bodies, but the same argument would apply to eating, yet we know we'll eat. Adam and Eve were created perfect, but did, did they sleep? Presumably. If so, sleep cannot be an imperfection. It's a matter of God's design for the rhythm of life. Well, I, I don't. I mean, I can see the logic in it. I don't see scriptural uh, scriptural proof of what he's saying there. I, 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 um, I disagree. I see a problem with his logic there. Um, his comparison eating to sleeping is two entirely different things. The we sleep uh, because we're forced to. Uh, our bodies have to have sleep, uh, or we'll get sick. We'll get it'll shut down. While yes, at the same time, we do need food for for uh, for sustenance we do need food to live or we'll die as well food is also an enjoyment factor type of thing there there's an enjoyment to few uh, to food um, sleep would be pointless there would be no no reason to me in heaven for downtime there'd be no <laughs> there'd be no reason for you to shut your eyes and go into some kind of a comatose state it just wouldn't serve any purpose. It would be kind of wasteful, actually. I mean, food we would enjoy because of the enjoyment of the various tastes of food. Um, and we would enjoy them in ways that wouldn't plague our bodies with being fat or, or you know, we'd be able to truly enjoy them in such a way where it wouldn't affect us negatively. Yeah. Um, sleep is something that's beyond, because I know lots of people, I'll, I'll put it to you this way, I know lots of people who tried their best to never sleep. <laughs> to to work through to pull all nighters and work all night and, and and wish they could stay up drink coffee and energy drinks to stay up, I've never met a person that didn't like to eat. <laughs> so, the the two are uh, uh, you know we we um we fight to get the good food and we fight to stay awake. We don't fight to go to go to sleep. We we tend to want to fight more to stay awake to get more done. So it's kind of. You know, I mean, counterproductive. Of, yeah, out of everything you've said there, what stood out to me was the idea that you, you can't see any real need for it, uh, and it seemed like it would be a waste of time. Why would we be in a like you called it comatose state, but we'd be in, in a unconscious state of sleep 
what's the point of it? We, we, we understand why we need it now, our bodies need it, but with a glorified body, maybe if our bodies don't need it, why would we waste time doing it? Right, right. I, 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 don't, I don't think we can waste time and if we have all eternity. Is the thing. <laughs> well, that's a good point. That's a good point, too. That's, uh, Jackson makes a good point. Um, I actually I mean, kind of disagree with Eric on this. Because I think there is an enjoyment factor in sleeping, because it get it, especially if I've been around people all day, and I I'm the kind of person. I mean, I'm I'm kind of kind of an extreme introvert. I've I've worked on it a lot with my therapist a lot, but there's a really nice thing about just cocooning up and uh, isolating yourself from everyone for a while, and then coming back refreshed. Yeah, so I kind of disagree with Eric on this. But if your body if your body is tired. Then, and you need the sleep, it does feel good to rest and get the sleep because right. you know, your body needs it. So right. It for, for instance, my, my, point, my point was, Jackson, when you're in the middle of doing something that you really enjoy, yeah. you don't go, you know, I'd really like to stop this and just go to sleep if you're not tired. You, oh, you, absolutely you not. Keep yeah. doing, you want to keep yeah, doing yeah. what you're doing. And that's kind of how I'm equating it. I'm saying if we're in a state of where we don't need it, and we're constantly learning, we're constantly doing things enjoyable, what would really make us want to go sleep? I mean, it really, to me, it would be like, I guess I look at it in a very simplistic, childlike mentality of when I get to heaven, it's like it's like Christmas for eternity, and I don't want to miss a thing. I don't want to close my eyes. I want to see, well, I don't, I don't think, I don't, <laughs> I want to see everything. <laughs> I don't think we'll miss anything, but like there might be, there might be like tomorrow night, uh, see part two of this movie or something like that, and you can sleep until you get, until you get to that. I mean, and, and you you may very well be correct. I don't know. It's it's one of those things we talk about. Luke always talks about often. We can speculate on this all we want. You know, we don't know for sure. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us this. Um, but I'm I'm just speaking, you know, if, as a, from a personal standpoint, you know, I don't want to miss a thing. I, I sure as heck don't want to sleep yeah. when I could be experiencing all these other things and I'm not tired and I don't really have any uh, use for sleep. You guys, you, you know, I made a video yesterday titled uh, "Arguing is Good," and uh, I, I, what I'm hearing here is an argument going on between Eric and Jackson over this question. Uh, but in, that is, separate, right? this is a this is a perfect example of what I call healthy healthy arguing. You know, uh, oh, no, one of us has to be kicked off the panel. Wait a second, Eric. Eric, I, I, I were you getting a little bit upset and irritated with Jackson? <laughs> No, not at all. I thought I, I understood exactly where he was coming Jackson, from. Jackson, I, I sensed maybe got it, you're growing a little impatient with Eric, and you're just about to start raising your voice at him. <laughs> oh, I was going to get so mad. I was going to throw my monitor. I was going to take an axe to my, yeah. my computer monitor. I was yeah. going to make a video that Eric is a child of Satan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there, here, I, I'm hoping that uh, people, you're watching this now, and you been following my videos for a while, and uh, you watched my video about arguing is good. You can see here, this is an example of what I'm talking about. Here we have um, uh, the ability to have a conversation, to disagree on someone. No one has to get angry, and no one has to you know, be in, in, offended because someone disagrees with them and calling them names. It remains cordial, and, and yet uh, I could say that Eric and uh, Jackson are actually arguing about this, uh, about the sleep, whether it's good or bad or needed or not. And I, I'm actually a little bit, I like both sides of this argument, but I think that uh, I'm leaning more towards Eric's side. But my question is this. There's a word in the Bible that I've always loved. I think it's only in KJV, and it's sluggard. The sluggard. sluggard. <laughs> now, in Proverbs, it talks, it's a book of wisdom. It's one short saying after another to give us wisdom. It talks about the sluggard will will be a failure. You know, they won't get out of bed. They're a sluggard. They're lazy. They just want to sleep all the time. You know. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think it'll be like that. But but one thing I I feel like I would miss if if Eric and your uh, view on this is correct is to me there's something I absolutely love about waking up on a day where I'm excited and stuff and. It's like kind of like the American Dad theme song, to put it in a humorous way. Good well, morning. you know what? It's funny you say that, Jackson, because I'm I'm willing in this instance. I'm I'm going to say I'm going to try. 
I'm going to try on your suit for a second, and I will say there's an advantage to that because with some of the pains and the things that I go through, I seldom ever get a good night's sleep. And maybe just as a trial, you know, uh, you know, something I'd like to try when I get to heaven is just to have, like, the ultimate night's sleep. I just I want to know what it's like to have the best night's sleep you ever had in your life. I, I never, Eric, actually, I never do either. In fact, I actually have somewhat of a sleep. <laughs> Disorder. I have to take melatonin, and and it, it, it's part. I'm 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 very active at night usually, and I, I sleep on a different schedule than everyone else. But I would just say I would I, I would just think that um, from that perspective, it'd be interesting, kind of like if somebody had any other health problem, to just well, have and and it's it's just, funny because I can see how based on that how that would be attractive to you, you know, based on your own. And my experience is, you know, p putting myself in that, in that, uh, in in your shoes like that too, having issues with pains and different things and just emotional things that I'm going through, where yeah. I just I haven't had a good night's sleep in such a long time, it, re it really makes sleep something look like, um, oh, something very precious. It's something when you do get a good night's sleep, you're like, wow, I wish I didn't have to get up and go to work the next day because I want to keep doing this for a while. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, let me, I'm just let saying, me. we can even, I, I would even think it'd be kind of cool to do a nocturnal spin on the cycle once in a while and everything, <laughs> where you wake up and the moon is coming out. <laughs> Work night shift, you say you want to... Just, just like, 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 for example, if you've ever, and I haven't done this in a while, I'm trying to get in more of a, I'm trying to re 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 do some things with the people that help me at college and everything, but if you ever work out really hard early in the morning, and then yeah. you just come back and you start seeing the sunrise, you just are yeah. like... Like the song "Walking on Sunshine" plays in your head. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Now let me kind of like evaluate your argument here and uh, kind of give my judgment on this argument. I think that uh, um, both of you presented some ideas, and both of you listened to the other side. And uh, I, I don't think either side was necessarily swayed to the other side. And yet, there was an exchange of ideas, and uh, Eric probably learned something from, from, from Jackson, his perspective. I think Jackson maybe learned something from Eric. So in an argument, sometimes you have, if it's done in, with civility, with basically just good manners, just be polite. In an, that kind of an argument, you, you, you either find out that you learned something and became persuaded, or the other person learned something and became persuaded, or nobody was persuaded, but we all learned something by exchanging ideas. So uh, I, I would say, well done. And that's the kind of arguing that I'm, I'm endorsing on YouTube, is that we should be able to talk about anything in the way that you guys just conducted your argument. All right. Um, now, Randy Alcorn says that uh, um, he considers this sleep part of God's design. It's a matter of God's design for the rhythm of life. Uh, sleep is one of life's great pleasures. It's part of God's perfect plan for humans in bodies living on the earth. Troubled sleep and sleepless, sleeplessness are products of sin and the curse, but sleep itself is God's gift. I believe we will likely need it and enjoy it. Um, I, again, I don't see any scriptural support for that conclusion, which he may or may not be right. He also says, some people say, but there won't be fatigue. And then Randy says, well, why not? C couldn't resources be depleted and renewed in a perfect but finite world, just as they were in Eden? We'll rest and be refreshed in heaven. What's more restful and refreshing than a good sleep? If we will eat, walk, serve, work, laugh, and play, why would we not sleep? Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and I'm going to disagree with him on this one. Um, but there won't be fatigue, he says, why not? Well, because we know fatigue came about after the fall. In fact, God said that as a result of his labor, man was gonna, he was going to do labor by the sweat of his brow. That wasn't the case beforehand. That was clearly something that came with the fall. Uh, man didn't work by the sweat of his brow, and, and, and it didn't beat him up to work. And you know He didn't have to deal with weeds and thistles and thorns and things like that pr prior to that. It, work wasn't a quote-unquote labor. It, it wasn't... Um, something that was um, uh, that we wind up despising because it makes us tired and fatigued. It was something that was a joy um, because we didn't have those issues. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not convinced by Andy's argument about sleep. Uh, now he asked the question, will we work? 
the idea of working in heaven is foreign to many people. Yet scripture clearly teaches it. When God created Adam, he took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. That's Genesis chapter 2. Work was part of the original Eden. It was part of a perfect human life on earth. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the idea of work uh, in, my, in my life, um, I've very seldom had jobs where I, I considered it um, a labor of love. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty much, uh, I needed to earn a living, and I did what was needed so I could get a paycheck to support me and my family, and uh, uh, if they weren't paying me, I wouldn't go in there and do it free just because I love doing it. Uh, so, in that kind of, when the connotation I get from the word work and labor uh, is, not a, is not a pleasant one, uh, you know, not a, uh, an appealing idea to me. And yet, if I was doing something that I just would love to do because uh, whether they paid me or not, would I even consider it work? So maybe even calling it work is, is the wrong idea to even refer to as work because it's not going to be laborious uh, if, if it's something we love to do. Yeah, it'd be like, it'd be like me becoming a film critic. <laughs> Well, no, I think, I, think uh, I, I, I hope that's my eternal reward that I get <laughs> the the film critic of heaven. I, I actually, actually, you know, it's so funny, Jackson, that you said that because there's a guy at work that says I should be a film critic. I always wind up talking about movies and films and things. I always wind up doing that too. It's funny, but um, no, but but Jackson's kind of right. He's right in what he's saying because. It's um the, the the work the quote unquote work that we're going to do in heaven is going to be tailored, designed, and fashioned for the things specific to us and what we would love to do. It's not going to be. You made the great point. There's a saying, you know, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And um and I think that's going to be the case in heaven. You know, we'll love what we do. To us, it won't be work. Will it be work for the Lord? Absolutely, it will be work for the Lord. But to us, it won't seem like worth. It, it'll be such a joy that we'll. I mean, imagine, imagine just getting up to work every day. If Jackson's right and we sleep, getting up to work every day, <laughs> and you don't dread the alarm clock. You get up and you're like, yes, another exciting day. I can't. Wait. It's almost like getting up and going fishing all day, or getting up and playing golf all day, or getting up and you know, you get up and it's always something you're to look forward to. Going to work at the movie theater. Right. Exactly. It's 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 a it's getting up and and living a life eternally of something that is fulfilling. And you love to do it. I mean, that's pretty special to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I know I love to learn, and I'm going to be learning a lot in eternity. And I, I've never really loved to work because of my what the way I explained my work. But uh, thankfully, I think that uh, in eternity I'll be doing some kind of things, activities that I won't even call them work, I, 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 because it's just going to be a pleasure all the time. Uh, he's, Randy says, work wasn't part of the curse. Mm. The curse, rather, made work menial, tedious, and frustrating. Quote, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food. Genesis chapter 3. Um, so he's saying the work is was not bad. It's just the fact that uh, the curse is what made the work bad because it became a, it became a toil. However, on the new earth, work will be redeemed and transformed into what God intended. Uh, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. Revelation chapter twenty-two. Serve is a verb. Servants are people who are active and occupied carrying out tasks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to be working, but I, uh, the way I see it is, is we're not going to, I, will, I probably won't even refer to it as work. It's not going to be, it won't be work the way I, uh, the way I see the word work. 
because work is a negative thing in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly understand that. Yeah. Uh, he's, he, he, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. He says, what kind of work will we do in heaven? Maybe you'll build a cabinet with Joseph of Nazareth or with Jesus. Maybe you'll tend sheep with David. Discuss medicine with Luke. Sew with Dorcas. Make clothes with Lydia. Design a new tent with Paul or Priscilla. Write a song with Isaac Watts. Ride horses with John Wesley. Or sing with Keith Green. Maybe you'll write a theology of the Trinity, bouncing your thoughts off Paul, John, Polycarp, Cyprian, Augustine, Calvin, Wesley, and even Jesus. That all sounds really good. Uh, our work will be joyful and fulfilling, giving glory to God. What could be better? Generally, unemployed people aren't happy. Work is a blessing, and not just because it's financial rewards. Even in a world under the curse, most of us have known satisfaction in our work. Spurgeon asked his congregation, Do you know, dear friends, the deliciousness of work? Yeah. I think yeah, he's basically uh, saying that's the same conclusion I think we have on about work. Uh, next, he asks, "Will we have our own homes?" Uh, perhaps you're familiar with Christ's promise in John one, uh, John fourteen, "In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you." The Vulgate, the Latin Bible, used the word "mansiones" in that verse, and the King James uh, Version followed by using uh, mansions. Unfortunately, that, re that rendering is misleading if it makes us envision having massive lodgings on separate estates. The intended meaning seems to be that we'll have separate dwellings on a single estate uh, or even separate rooms within the same house. I don't know how he comes up with that, but what do you think? We'll we'll be like living in some uh, condo building. Uh, everybody has their own little condo. Uh, uh, are we going to have our own uh, giant estates uh, that uh, that are mansion like? It well, if it, on eternal go ahead. what was that? But it may depend on eternal reward, is what I was saying for that. But I, I would rather live in just a little condominium by myself. Like I love the apartment building that I live in, just all alone. Yeah. Well, if it is a con if they are condos, they're going to be the nicest condos you've ever seen. So. Because <laughs> that's a preference thing. Some people want to live in a huge house. Others don't. I used to live in this little tiny condo on uh, Waikiki, Hawaii. It was like 600 square feet, but it was it was wonderful because of where it was, uh, and I can say maybe that will be a, same th same thing could be said about heaven. Uh, uh, even if I have a little tiny condo, it, because I'm in heaven, I'm on the new earth and just enjoying everything else that that I won't care if, that it's a little condo or not, you know. Hmm. Maybe Jackson's right, though, that part of our rewards system uh, will be determining the type of uh, dwelling that we have. Maybe it also depends on the, the desires of the person. Like Jackson said, he'll be perfectly happy having a condo. Maybe some other person probably wouldn't be happy unless they had a mansion, because that's what I'll they've I'll always wanted. If I had a mansion they get a condo, I'll trade them. I'd much rather have... A little condo just like I live in right now, only if it's an apartment. I love just living in a studio up there. Yeah. Maybe you can timeshare out your apartment and go into the man the mansion for sometimes. Yeah, I, 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 I getting to heaven going, Oh no, not again. You mean these salesmen <laughs> were saved? I, t I tend to agree with uh, something Luke had said, which is I think I think we have to keep following the mindset that our rewards in heaven, these places that God is doing for us, are tailor made for us. So it's it's going to be tailor made for your liking, you know. Jesus, it, it wouldn't be much of a gift if God gave you something that you didn't like, right? I mean, he's he's going to give you something that's going to be designed specifically for you. It's going to be designed that you, in your tastes and your likings, you will like it. So I think I think Luke's point was was true. I think I think they're going to be different. I think they're all going to be different. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, here's the Charles Spurgeon quote. Uh, Christian, meditate much on heaven. It will help thee to press on and to forget the toil of the way. This veil of tears is but the pathway to the better country. This world of woe is but the stepping stone to a world of bliss. And after death, what cometh? What wonderful world will open upon our astonished sight? Yeah. I think that's really kind of condensing, you know, the, uh, the whole point of this whole study on heaven is that uh, the more we understand about heaven uh, the, and the, the more we can appreciate what we have waiting for us and, and it's much easier to get through the problems of this life when we know uh, what's, what's ahead. Um, uh, and he, Randy says, heaven isn't likely to have lots of identical residences. God loves diversity and he tailor makes his children and his provisions for them. When we see the particular place he's prepared for us, not just for mankind in general, but for us in particular, we'll rejoice to see our ideal home. I think that, uh, that goes back to the same ideas that, you know, the work is customized for us, the, the, the residence will be customized for us. Uh, he's not going to give us work that will make us unhappy or home that makes us un unhappy. So uh, whatever our desire, sometimes maybe our desire, some of the desires will bring along with us. If, if a person's always dreamed of living in a mansion with a giant uh, lot, um, and it, uh, maybe God says, well, they've always wanted that. I want to give it to them now. That's going to want to make them happy. Or, or maybe the person will come to their senses and say, well, I always wanted to be in a mansion, but I realize that's not even important to me anymore. I, I, I'm just, you know, my, my, my uh, desires have changed now. Okay, we're going to move on to Chapter 34, unless you guys want to talk more about the residences and the work and the sleep. Okay. Um, chapter 34, uh, the question that Randy has as a title is, will we desire relationships with anyone except God? Hmm. Well, I'd like to ask you guys to answer the question before we even get to Randy's answers. What do you think? My answer to that question would be, of course, we would desire relationships with other people um, because we'll finally be able to know and love and experience each other on a level that we've never been able to before. You know, we, we can only get as close to people as, as we can in sin. Um, sin, puts up, sin puts up natural barriers to everything, relationships, um, uh between us and God, between each other, um, it it really binds us. It holds us back from so much. I mean, of course you're going to want to have relationships with other people, including God, because um, you want to share. I've mentioned this all before, but you want to share all these joys and see the joy in other people who maybe have spent a lot of their life with, you know, having hardly any joy because of the things they've dealt with in life. Um you want to see them, experience that. You you want to get a kick out of seeing them enjoy themselves. You want to you want to enjoy things together. You want to you want to share this this great joy God is giving you. So I think that's an easy question to answer. Absolutely, we'll desire other relationships too. Jackson, um, I tend to think yes, we will. Um, it, it, it's it's kind of interesting to me too, like how. People barely know their neighbors usually, and that kind of thing. I've always thought that that's kind of weird. You know, it's like I live in this building with other people, and there are people I haven't even met in this building, and all this stuff. But I mean, I kind of think that in heaven, everyone's going to know everybody, and everybody's going to love everybody. You know, and it's not going to be, it's it's not going to be like this. Oh, that person lives next to me, and I I, I only see him when I check my mail or something like that. Yeah, that's a good point. How does he keep coming up with this stuff, Eric, huh? It's good stuff. Oh, yeah. That's why he's here with us. <laughs> Very good. Um, I, uh, you know, it's easy for someone to be 
again, a lot of things I've heard from people, I think we've con concluded that they say these things because they want to come off as being very, very pious. And that, oh, I don't care about having a mansion, or I don't care, you know, what, what my role is or my rewards, or, you know, uh, they seem very humble and pious. Uh, maybe they really feel that way, but but I, I, I'm a little suspicious. Uh, so some people would be probably tempted to say, well, no, we won't eat, care about anybody else. We'll only want to be with God all the time and only think about God and not anybody else. Uh, but uh, I, I think that there are there. I have family and friends right now that I definitely want to maintain my relationships with them in eternity. I mean, I, I have family and friends that I know are saved, and I'm gonna. I think it's gonna be very important to me to to maintain my friendship and family relationship with them in eternity. Uh, and if I didn't, I don't. Th I don't know if I would be happy. I mean, it'd be, it would be such a loss. Uh, as much as I want to be with God, and God will be the, the the ultimate, and yet I still value these relationships. I even think that there I've got some family and friends that um, uh, who are saved, but and yet these relationships are estranged. Um, and and I think I'll even look forward to those relationships because those relationships won't be estranged anymore. I'll actually right. like to be around some people that right. I don't. Be around right now. <laughs> that, right. Um, that would be wonderful too. You know what you just said, Luke, brought something else to my mind. I'm glad you said it, and and the Holy Spirit. I'm glad the Holy Spirit inspired me to think it. Um, I I know for a fact that we'll desire other relationships because there's one relationship I desire already, and that relationship is it, one of the great joys I think of going to heaven is if in some way some small way my life was an inspiration to someone else or something I said to them or something I did or a word I shared with them or just a loving touch or, or a moment or a listening ear wound up indirectly being the seed or part of the water that brought that person to Christ I, I really want to see those people in heaven I, I want to know them. I want to see. I, I would get a, a huge kick out of God saying, "Remember this person you talked to a while back? Well, guess what? They're here, and they wanted to see you, and 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 so you could share that love together. And it, it, those are some of the experiences. So those are definitely relationships we want to see. We want to see relationships to those those seeds that we plant that we don't ever get to see watered that we want to see come back for us and say, "You planted that seed." That seed was planted by you, watered by others, and now those, well, everybody who had a hand in that could come together around these people who are now saved and, and experience that. I, I think that's going to be one of the great relationships. Amen. Amen. I think that uh, uh, probably most of the people who watch any of these videos here, uh, they're pretty serious about their Christianity. Most of them you know, study the Bible at least to a certain extent and, and uh, probably attend church. Uh, and th these people uh, probably do, to a certain extent, some witnessing. And for, for any of us who have um, um, been felt led, compelled to witness, to tell people about Jesus, uh, I think that is, in the back of our minds, we always wonder, I, I, I sure hope that uh, some of the people saw the light, and I'd love to know about it. That's why at the end of every show I ask everybody, if, if, if you watch this and now you put your faith in Jesus, please make a comment. We want to know about it. I think in heaven we'll all want to know too. Absolutely. Just It'll just be such an exciting, happy feeling to know that uh, we, because we told someone about Jesus, they have eternal life in heaven. Jackson, what about you? Um, as far as uh, as far as relationships in heaven, you're saying, or well, the question is, will we desire relationships with anyone except God in heaven? Right, and I, like I said, I think the answer is yes. I think that's kind of how God made us, you know. Okay. All right. Uh, he says uh, throughout the ages, Christians have anticipated eternal reunion with their loved ones. In 710, the Venerable uh, Bede, 
Beatty, a church historian, wrote these words about heaven. A great multitude of dear ones is there expecting us. A vast and mighty crowd of parents, brothers, and children, secure now of their own safety, anxious yet for our salvation, long that we may come to their right and embrace them. Uh, to that to that joy which will be common to us and to them, to that pleasure expected by our fellow servants as well as ourselves, to that full and perpetual felicity. Uh, if it be a, a pleasure to go to them, let us eagerly and covetously hasten on our way that we may soon be with them and soon be with Christ. Um, I think that a person can easily err to, to either extreme here. Uh, I've heard a lot of people have these experiences that they went to heaven and, and they saw their friends or their family or something, but there's no reference. They never even saw God. They just, they just saw their, uh, they didn't, there's no Jesus, there's no God, but there's friends and families were there. Uh, and then another person could take the other extreme like here, will, will we even have any relationships? Will we care to have a relationship with people or we just want a relationship with God? I think both of these are extreme viewpoints that some people leave out God and only want relationships with their family and friends. Others neglect that entirely and say that they only value the relationship with God. So there's a, uh, a perspective that's balanced here, I think, is the correct one. Well, uh, you have to be careful because a lot of those people will teach false doctrine who say mm -hmm. that they've seen heaven and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they'll, uh, have their, um, they they'll have their experience take precedence over the Word of God. And I mm -hmm. like. You know, Pen Pastor Dennis Roxer of Duluth Bible Church, who I've mentioned a lot of times, has a, some really good series warning against what he calls mysticism, which entails mm -hmm. things like this. So we need to keep that in mind, too. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I will expand what you said. You said a lot of them teach, teach false doctrine. Uh, personally, from my, to my knowledge, they all teach false doctrine because none of them ever say that... Uh, they went there because of their faith in Jesus. The other people there because of their faith in Jesus. None of them say that. None of these, uh, you know, visits to heaven experiences. Yeah, almost like like there was one guy. There was one guy, Howard Storm, who he didn't really say one way or the other on that or whatever. But all the others I've heard, except for him, and I'm just I'm very I'm always careful to make blanket statements. But he, uh, they, they'll teach work salvation. You know, like. Or they'll say you can lose their salvation. They'll say they saw people who almost made it but then didn't because they did some bad sin and that kind of thing. And it's, yeah. It's, it, I think oftentimes this these people. It's not that I think sometimes these people are just lying. Other times I honestly think if somebody's close to death, they could have a demonic vision to tell people something false or something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sus I suspect that uh, if if they if they say they went to heaven. And they come back with a message that, that either omits or changes the, the, uh, the importance of, of Jesus, uh, then, uh, uh, then it is, it is uh, demonic, I believe. Right. Yes. Right. Okay, his next question is, will we want anyone besides Christ? Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, Revelation chapter 22. He alone is sufficient to meet all our needs. Yet God has designed us for relationship, not only with himself, but also with others of our kind. After God created the world, he stepped back to look at his work and pronounced it very good. However, before his creation was, uh, was complete, he said that one thing, and only one, was not good. Quote, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Genesis chapter 2. God planned for Adam and all mankind to need human companionship. In other words, God made people to need and desire others besides himself. Yeah. I just... Uh, as much as we've talked in prior episodes about the glory of God and being in His presence and this bliss and awe and stuff, and uh, to, to, to to think that that uh, 
we'll no longer have the interest or, or there's no need for us to, ha to uh, think about other people and have relations with other people. That seems pretty crazy to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he says, to some people, this sounds like heresy. After all, um, uh, Asaph prays, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. That's Psalm 73. I guess... Uh, Uh, is he stuck? Oh, oh I, right. I thought he was stuck. What's that? Oh, there you go. You're stuck for a second there. You were frozen for a second, but then you... you oh, I was? Uh, how about now? Yeah, uh, you're, you're good. Now. You're good. Okay. I'll read this again. He says, To some people, this sounds like heresy. After all, Asaph prays, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. Psalm 73. Uh, and I said that, you know, the Psalms, we, most people think the Psalms were written by David, and they were mostly, but I guess this Psalm was written by someone named Asaph. Mm -hmm. And he says, Whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. Uh, again, that sounds wonderful, but um, a person could take that to the point where they have no interest in other people at all. This verse is sometimes used to prove that we should desire nothing but God, that it is wrong to desire earthly things, including human relationships. But God made us to desire earthly things such as food, water, shelter, warmth, work, play, rest, human friendship, and much more. That won't change in heaven. Yeah. So what do you think of that verse? I, I, I'm not really uh, that familiar with it. I don't, I don't know if I have read Psalm 73 many times yeah I'm not I'm, I, I haven't read it I don't think uh, so I can't comment I would I would have to uh, read over it I mean I know just from other, just from other, some of the other Psalms for instance and some of the things David uh, wrote in the Psalms um, sometimes in the Psalms it tends to be there are moments there the, the, the Psalms are emotional up and down moments and sort of put to pen that that David and, for instance, Asaph had had put down. So in moments, David even speaks like that because he's going through moments of extreme trauma and despair. He feels as if all of his friends have left him. He cannot trust anyone. His own family members hate him. Uh, and and it's those times where he goes to God, and says, "I have nothing but you. I don't." You know, um, there are these the, the, the Psalms are really really great because they're they're a kind of a window into David's soul sometimes to kind of see what he was emotionally going through at some of the toughest times in his life. And we can really relate to that I think sometimes. And I think maybe that's what we're dealing with with Asaph here is a sort of thing. Maybe he was going through something where he's praying to God, he's crying out to God because he feels as if he has nothing else. He's gotten to the point, and I know I feel like this sometimes when I, you know, the things I deal with in my life, I feel like, God, you know, I just, the world has nothing else for me anymore. I don't desire to be here anymore. I want to be with you. Um, it, it's you have those moments emotionally up and down. I'm saying that's a possibility. I don't know for sure if that's a case, but I, I think to simply take one psalm line and develop that that's a, a mindset we should have that oh no, all should we ever care about is God. We shouldn't care about other people. We should that's. I mean, I, I think that's kind of being a little presumptuous. I think. Yeah, should, what about what about all of the passages in in First John, especially about loving your brother? Uh, exactly, exactly. And and I was I was kind of heading in that direction, Jackson. That's a good point. Um, you know, we're not told nothing in the New Testament says we as Christians, as as followers of Christ, uh, that we are to be seclusionists who have nothing to do with anybody else. In fact, the opposite said. Yeah, and in fact, um, in First John four, it says if you if you don't love your brother whom you have seen, how will you love God whom you've not seen? It says that in First John. So right. And I know people are going to point out now. There, know there are passages where Paul tells us we got to separate ourselves from the. And yes, we do. But he's talking about in regards to being with those groups and appearing to be um, uh, approving of what they're doing. I mean, he's saying you've got to come away from these groups who do these things. It's one thing if you're going to these groups to say, look, you have to stop this and that. You need to 
you know, you need to straighten this out, you need to change this. It's one thing if that's what you're doing. I mean, Jesus went and went with the sinners and the tax collectors and the, you know, but he didn't go there just to hang out with them he, we, or to approve of their behavior. He went there to bring them the word. He went there to bring them, you know, the message of their salvation. You know, so it's the purpose and why you're with these people. So in those moments where the Bible is appearing to tell or say people are being a little secluded, I think it's moments in their lives that are happening and you got to consider that in the context of what's again context of what's going on around the individual at the time he's saying these things. Well, and, and the other thing, Eric, that that's very uh, that the, the point I want to expand on that you made about improving of these groups. You know, I don't believe that we as Christians should go to churches that have a false gospel message, which mm -hmm. unfortunately is most churches. See, my parents would disagree with this. My parents say, why don't you go to church? I say, because there isn't one in Fort Collins that I know of that really teaches the true gospel. They all teach some kind of part works, part lordship, salvation. But I just think if I go to those churches, I'm I'm sort of approving or supporting of a false ministry. Well, right, and that's kind of what I was saying. It's, it's kind of like... Thing, but it depends on your reasons for going. If your reason for going there is to say, look, I want to point out your doctrine is flawed. What you're doing here is not right. That's yeah. one thing. But you can't yeah. just go there for the sake of going there just because it says it's a church and you're just trying to be part of a church. That's never yeah. a good a good thing to do. And unfortunately, what what we realize as as grace believers is we really live in a time of apostasy. You know, yeah. most churches preach a false gospel. Yes, unfortunately. It's, unfortunately, it's, it's right. Bad, it's true. Mm -hmm. Wow, the police coming for you, Jackson? <laughs> They're always in Fort Collins uh, arresting someone for marijuana. <laughs> or for some drugs, not for marijuana, because that's legal, but yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Randy says, People have told me we shouldn't long for heaven, only for God. If that were true, God would condemn rather than command his people who... We're longing for a better country, a heavenly one, Hebrews chapter 11. King David saw no contradiction between seeking God, the person, and seeking heaven, the place. The two were inseparable. One thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, uh, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Uh, notice that David says he seeks one thing, to be in God's magnificent place and to be with God's magnificent person. As I said in chapter 17, we must understand that God is the source of all joy. All other joys are secondary and derivative. They come from him, find their meaning in him, and cannot be divorced from him. Likewise, while Christ is our primary treasure, he encourages us to store up other treasures in heaven. Matthew chapter 6. So, uh, as much as, uh, you know, the, the glory of God, this magnificence, this ec ecstatic uh, feeling of, of being in the presence of God is, is something that we will crave and will want to be, be with. I, we're not going to just forget about other people that we love and and uh, um, you know now just get so intoxicated in the glory of God that we just don't want to uh, have anything to do with any other people <laughs> you know you know as soon as I hear you read that line I go right back to what you said you know, people have told me uh, we shouldn't long for heaven only for God again I'm sorry that's that's just to me I that's the words of somebody trying to be pious and whenever, whenever, whenever I hear somebody say that, I immediately go to the part in Scripture where Jesus is going to wash the apostles' feet. And and Peter, he's a great guy, but he always has these moments. You know, he has these moments where he just goes too far. And Jesus is washing the apostles' feet, and he comes to Peter, and Peter very piously attempts to say, "You're not going to wash my feet. I'll never allow you to wash my feet." You know, it was a pious thing. It was he was trying to be pious. He was trying to, you know, and and the Lord says to him, you know, Peter, if you don't allow me to do this, you have no part with me. And of course, what's the next thing he does? Well, he says, oh, then wash all of me. You know. <laughs>
And Jesus tells him, Peter, you don't need to be washed all over. You just need your feet. Your feet are what's dirty. So it's it's one of these things where people just take things to the extreme because they think they need to. They think they – and that comes from – I'm sorry, guys, but it comes from these people – who go around pointing the finger saying you got to be a holy person and you got to be righteous all the time and you got to that's where that kind of thing it breeds that kind of mentality where then I got to begin to only say things that are only pious all the time and say things that are righteous all the time and say and it begins to that's really more an act because if you go into your heart we all know if Christ tells us I have treasures for you in heaven of course we're going to think about those treasures in heaven. Why would that be wrong? That wouldn't be something wrong. He told us about them. If he didn't want us to think about the treasures in heaven, he never would have told us about the treasures in heaven. Mm -hmm. okay, I would just like to plus one everything Eric said there, but also add this. A lot of people, unlike Peter, actually take this even further and will make up doctrine based on it. I mean, yeah. I I hear people say that if the only reason you accept Christ is because you want to go to heaven or don't want to go to hell, that you're not truly a Christian. <laughs> that your motivation has to be totally divorced from that. I mean, I've heard many people say that you're not a true believer, or one person said you're not a true believer if you'd be happy if Christ would still be happy in heaven, even if God wasn't there and stuff. And they'll they'll make up they'll 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 t they'll, they'll kind of do what Peter did, but they'll go so extreme they'll actually make up false doctrine. As extreme as that sounds, I run into it all the time. So let me oh, just... Oh, no. Absolutely. Here. Yeah. Well, what's the best way to uh, identify false doctrine? It usually places the uh, the the burden or the, the requirements on you rather than on Jesus. You know, it's about all the things you do. It's about human effort. Yeah, it's, one one of the one of the biggest keys to false doctrine, uh, false religions is the work is all on you. The work is all on you building your ladder to heaven. Well, the uh, uh, someone said that if you want to be able to easily identify uh, a counterfeit hundred dollar bill, you don't study counterfeits. You study the real one. Mm -hmm. And when you get so familiar with knowing what a real one looks like then when you see a counterfeit, it stands out like a sore thumb. That's you. right. That's so, right. Uh, I believe the most important thing to do to, to uh, be able to identify these false doctrines is to be so familiar with the truth from the scriptures right. that you can easily spot it. Spot it. And, and what you guys are talking about is salvation, uh, particularly, and, and that is the biggest mistake in uh, the false teaching about salvation is that somehow man has to earn it. And, mm -hmm. and we know that Nobody gets. Nobody can earn it. We have to throw up our hands in defeat and say, "I give up. I can't earn it. I need you, right. to Savior Jesus." Right. Okay. Um, uh oh. Gosh, I lost my place again here. Will we recognize? Hey, as soon as I. Uh, oh, here it is. I don't oh, have the same page it numbers it you did. Yeah. Uh, okay, we'll move on to now. The uh, the question is, uh, uh, what did Paul say about reunion in heaven? Uh, Paul says to his friends in Thessalonica, we loved you so much, and you had become so dear to us, then speaks of his intense longing to be with them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. In fact, Paul anticipates his ongoing relationship with the Thessalonians as part of his heavenly reward. He says, What is our hope of our joy or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Hmm. So uh, he's, uh, he's getting joy uh, out of knowing that he has these friendships. He's, Paul even referred to people as his children, you know, because he led them to the Lord. <laughs> Some of the Roman Catholics want to use that as uh, Paul's uh, becoming like a, a Catholic priest, being the father, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But uh, Paul thought of all the people he led to the Lord as his spiritual children, uh, and so you can see the affection he has for them, and he longs to be with them, uh, to, to see them in heaven. Um, isn't this emphatic proof that it's appropriate for us to deeply love people and look forward to being with them in heaven? Paul sees no contradiction in ref referring to both Christ and his friends as his hope and joy and crown in heaven. Paul then asks, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? The joy he takes uh, in his friends doesn't compete with his joy in God. It's part of it. Paul thanks God for his friends. Whenever we're moved to thank God for people, we're experiencing exactly what he intended. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I see. I, I do see some people erring on the, the extreme of, well, uh, the only thing that uh, I care about is being with God, and, and, and I don't care about being with the people, or uh, I, I don't care how uh, big my mansion is or what my rewards are. This this pious hum humility that is, uh, um, I know I, I'm suspicious of it, the sincerity of it, really. Uh, but but according to this. Paul wasn't that way. He, he, he was saying that uh, uh, the idea that he loved his uh, his church in Thessalonica so much that he was he considered it to be part of his reward, and it was uh, such a great blessing that he would he knew that they were going to be with him in heaven, and that's he placed great value on them. Paul also says that the Thessalonians. You long to see us just as we also long to see you. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again. Paul finds joy in God's presence because of other Christians. He anticipates the day when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. He looks forward to being with Jesus and his people. Now, we, Paul asked, I mean, uh, Randy Alcorn asked the question, will we recognize each other? What's, what's your first reaction to that question? Are you going to recognize Jackson in heaven, uh, Eric? Yes, I believe we will. Even if we don't quite look exactly the same, I believe we're going to know each other. I believe we're going to know who, who the people are. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, Jackson has this icon up there, uh, but, uh, you know, I've seen his actual face. I, I know how handsome he really is. Uh, he, he's very modest, and he doesn't like to show his face because, uh, you know, then by contrast, you know, you know, we wouldn't look so good if we were contrasted with, with <laughs> Jackson's good look. Uh, so, but, but so in, in heaven, as if, Will you actually see Jackson? Ah, oh, that's Jackson! I gotta go talk to Jackson. So everyone knows that I'm not quite that extremely pious. The reason I put my icon up is because I'm stimming like crazy, and I don't want to stop everything forever. Yeah, I tried to have it once where I didn't have that, and I was it's hard for me to focus on the conversation. So, so it's not because if you're very humble about your your good looks, then, huh? Well, I don't. I wouldn't consider myself that good looking at all. But. Well, okay. I'm not going. I shouldn't talk any further about his good looks, or someone might get the wrong idea here. <laughs> okay, so will we recognize each other? When asked if we should would recognize friends in heaven, George MacDonald responded, "Shall we be greater fools in paradise than we are here?" <laughs> that's a that's a great line. I like that. Yeah. Uh, but well, you know, you know, one of the things I think about. Well, okay, there's a really easy question for this. What room do you find yourself more comfortable in? A room full of people that you know or a room full of people you have no clue who they are? <laughs> You'd be more comfortable in the room full of people that you know and love. I mean, I mean, you would, of course you're going to recognize each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a, I don't know. To me, that, that's kind of a, I, I'm not really into sarcasm. 
And that's kind of a sarcastic statement. But in this case, I kind of... <laughs> he, he, will, will you recognize your friends in heaven? And he says, shall we be greater fools in paradise than we are here? <laughs> it's pretty profound when you really think about it. Come on. Don't act so so crazy, you know. Why wouldn't you recognize your friends? Yeah, it's, that, that's you know, that's that's exactly that's exactly what I got. I could it was his version of saying, "Don't be stupid." Yeah. <laughs> of course, we're going to recognize each other. I was confused as to what he meant until you guys just clarified that. So. No, he was he was saying, "Are we going to wind up absolutely you know total morons when we go to heaven that we won't recognize each other anymore?" He said, "He said that's just a stupid thing to think. Of course, we'll recognize each other." Uh -huh. uh, then he says, uh, yet many people wonder whether we'll know each other in heaven. What lies behind that question is Christoplatonism and the false assumption that in heaven we'll be disembodied spirits who lose our identities and memories. How does someone recognize a spirit? As we've seen, however, these assumptions are unbiblical. Christ's disciples recognized him countless times after his resurrection. They recognized him on the shore as he cooked breakfast for them. They recognized him when he appeared to a skeptical Thomas. They recognized him when he appeared to 500 people at once. It's really, uh, the way that some people come up with these, uh, these theories, uh, it, Christoplatonism probably does play a role in this to a certain extent. Some of it is just sheer biblical ignorance of, of what the scriptures actually say about you know eternity. Well, you know what I, I I think that I mean this is this is people would deny this and deny this, but I, I kind of think some of this is ego driven doctrine. Yeah. Like like um like you know uh, of course we we um. We, you can't go to heaven if the only thing you want to do is escape hell and everything, you know. Well, of course, you've got to you've got to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Of course, we we won't have physical bodies because it's like it's like a false sense of humility. It's really pride, you know, mm -hmm. against uh, against the body and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I'm and I'm sure that some of these people, that even though they are. Uh, Making these kinds of statements, and I'm sure some of these people are Christians. They're they're saved, and yet they they say these crazy things. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes maybe it's just your ignorance. Sometimes it is maybe false false humility. Uh, yeah, the disembodied spirits thing. I can see how there'd be a misconception about that. But like the other things about. You can't go to heaven if this or that. Then I start to question whether that person is, is a Christian because they're adding on biblical requirements. Yeah. Um, so he says, um, also, what about Mary at the garden tomb or the two men on the road to Emmaus? They didn't recognize Jesus. Some people have argued that from this that Jesus was unrecognizable, but at a closer look, uh, but a closer look shows otherwise. Uh, Jesus said to Mary in the garden, Woman, are, why are you crying? Who, who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. John chapter 20. A distressed, teary-eyed, Mary, knowing Jesus was dead and not making eye contact with a stranger, naturally assumed he was the gardener. But as soon as Jesus said her name, he rec she recognized him. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Um, you think that his explanation of that, what transpired there, is... Uh, is is correct the way you, you see it? He's saying that because... Yeah, he's saying because it, at first glance she doesn't recognize him, so people naturally assume, well, he, he didn't look anything like himself, he didn't, you know, and, and in that case he, he may have... So. You, you, but you talked about that before, Luke. You kind of mentioned, you said there could have been an instance where maybe originally he did have himself look a little different at first. You know, that might have been something he did. Um... But but then he did allow himself to be recognized. 
So, yeah, you know, there's all kinds of, of you know different ways of uh, trying to explain the, these things. Uh, one is what I've said is that Jesus possibly has the ability to just change his appearance so that he's un not recognized until he wants to reveal who he is, and then his appearance is uh, uh, one that they can recognize. Uh, another was what he, he's alluding to here is the woman, he says, um, not making eye contact with a stranger. Uh, I've heard people teach this that the Jewish women would, you know, they, they would never make eye contact with a stranger, especially a woman making eye contact with a man. Mm -hmm. so, so perhaps for that reason she didn't look to see who he was and other people said well it was because the sunlight was in her eyes and she couldn't recognize him at first until, the, until the, she moved at the right angle uh, but for whatever reason she didn't recognize him at first but then he became recognizable uh, and so the point here is that will we recognize each other well why not I mean people could recognize Jesus Mm -hmm. Unless unless the sun was in their eyes or they weren't looking or maybe he he can he changed his appearance uh, temporarily for a purpose. Some commentators emphasize that the disciples on the road to Emmaus uh, on the Emmaus road didn't recognize Jesus. But notice that the text says, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Luke chapter twenty four. God miraculously intervened to keep them from recognizing him. The implication is that ap apart from supernatural intervention, the men would have recognized Jesus as they did later. A quote, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Luke chapter 24. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, it, it looks like it's not because they didn't make eye contact or the sun was in their eyes or for but for another reason they didn't recognize it said that they were kept from recognizing him so for somehow that that more supports my uh, theory that he was able to change his appearance I don't I shouldn't say mine it's not my original idea but but it's uh, 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 it, it seems like it fits in this particular case better than any others Another indication that we'll recognize uh, people in heaven is Christ's transfiguration. Christ's disciples recognized the bodies of Moses and Elijah, even though the disciples couldn't have known what the two men looked like. This may suggest that personality will emanate through a person's body, so we'll instantly recognize people we know of but haven't previously met. If, if we can recognize those we've never seen, how much more will we recognize our family and friends? That is really interesting. Uh, I often wondered about how they could recognize Moses and, and Elijah. I mean, it wasn't like people had photographs of them or there were paintings of them all over for the, everybody knew what they actually looked like. Uh, well, that's, yeah, it's a good, well, maybe that kind of plays into what we talked about as far as maybe there will be something in the knowledge God will give us to be aware and we'll simply know who these people are. We'll simply know yeah. them. Um, uh, for whatever reason, they did know who they were. Um, it's not explained. Um, yeah. But I, like I said, it, it can only be. But remember, that was a mirac rather miraculous moment. So suffice to say, I think God may have opened their eyes to who they were, it, which is another way of saying gave them the knowledge of who they were looking at. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we're going to end here and pick up uh, next with chapter 35. And I know a lot of people are going to be very interested in this particular uh, study because the question is, will there be marriage, families, and friendships uh, in, in heaven on the new earth? That's chapter 35. Uh, so... Let's kind of sum up what we've discussed today. Anything that stood out before we close here? Either one of you, whatever you think was uh, uh, most interesting and worth repeating. The things that stood out to me most, what we talked about, were, um, you know, the, the thing I think we need to keep in mind as far as um, things in heaven, as far as work, um, we hear these terms, but they're relative to what we understand as work. Um, 
these things, our treasures, our rewards, our, these things are going to be tailored to us as individuals. Um, because God knows what we love. He made us the way we, he made us who we are with our imaginations, the, our personalities. Um, he knows what we love, and a loving God wants to reward you with the things that he knows you'll like. There is no concern anybody has to have in heaven about when I go to heaven, am I going to be doing something I'm not going to like? Is there? But and of course not. No, you're going to have you're going to be doing something that God's tailored specifically to you, unlike any job you've ever had in this world. No job you've ever had in this world has ever been specifically tailored to you like God's going to tailor His work for you. The other thing really is. I don't understand why anybody would ever want to take away from the concept of fellowship in heaven. I understand the people who say, well, we should only be focused on God. We should only be focused on God. I understand what you're trying to do, and I understand what you're trying to say. But it's simply – it's it's being – it's doing what Peter did. You're going beyond what you need to do. That's not what God is telling us to do. I can't imagine – anything greater than that moment in heaven when we realize hey guys hey girls we have experienced the worst together now it's time to experience the best I mean this is sharing that experience to me is half the experience that's yeah I pray thank you brother I, I agree that uh, I think that the uh, idea that um, uh, God knows our personality, our interests, our and, and, and the, the type of mansion we want, the amount of sleep or lack of sleep that we'll want, the uh, all these other things that uh, people are wondering, well, is it going to be right for me? Uh, you know, uh, God God is going to customize everything because it says that we're going to be happy no more sorrow or anything you, it, it, obviously if you had a job that you didn't like you're gonna you're gonna be sorrowful there's gonna be tears <laughs> yeah. right. exactly so, you know nobody really needs to worry about uh, you know uh, doing work that you feel oh this is really work no whatever you, you're gonna be doing is, is something that God has uh, given you to do that's gonna give you joy because we're gonna have nothing but joy and uh, Okay, brother, brother Jackson, what stood out to you in the in the show? And don't talk, start talking about sleep again. <laughs> um, I wonder. Um, I wonder how how indestructible our our bodies will be in regards to like like we talked about the sleep thing, but it's interesting how we will eat and everything. I wonder if we can we'll be able to fall from buildings without it hurting whatsoever. So. <laughs> yeah, but you'll probably be more coordinated than falling down. <laughs> but if you did, I don't think you'd have anything to worry about. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, I know. I I think that we will be uh, like a superman in, in in some respects, far super superior to to what we are now, but. Uh, Okay, Jackson, uh, nothing, nothing else that you want to say before we close as far as this, what we discussed today? Nothing that Eric hasn't already said. So. You know, it's always a safe bet to say, I agree with Eric. <laughs> oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> no, it's not. Because we came up with that thing with the Millennium Saints that I really disagreed with, if you don't remember. Yeah. The, well, yeah, no, well, wait a minute, I retracted that, remember, because I said, oh, yeah, I screwed up. Never mind, I, I messed up on that one. And you guys have this, had this horrible argument over how much sleep we're going to have in heaven, too. That was pretty pretty, pretty distasteful to have you guys arguing like that. I know. It was a knockout. Well, yeah, really it's fun. not going to stop there. Remember, I'm going to make a video about how Eric is a heretic, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote things he says out of context and put it on loop and everything. <laughs> okay, um... Uh, I, I'm looking forward to the next one or two as we close out this study on on uh, uh, on heaven, and we move on to the next topic, which will be uh, ready with an answer. Uh, we want to start uh, promoting this this new show coming up because uh, if you if you have any theological questions, send them to me uh, and everybody on the panel. If you have questions, start making your own list so that we can just be just spend the rest of our time just answering all the questions that we have and that uh, uh, other people have of us 
and um, looking forward to starting that. So we're, we're almost finished with heaven. Maybe one or two more episodes I think will be finished. Next time we're going to be discussing marriage in heaven. Okay, so now we know that some people are probably getting excited about heaven who watch this. Uh, we want to tell them uh, uh, everything that they've got to do so that they can go to heaven. Okay, so uh, brother, brother Jackson, uh, if someone asks you right now, okay, I, I want to go to heaven, and now you got me excited, what do I have to do? I would tell them what they, would have, what they have to do is to believe the gospel, the saving message, which is God sent his perfect son, Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, the Son of God and God the Son, to die in our place for our sins. Because you see, God is perfect. He has no sin on him whatsoever. To go to heaven, we would need to be sinlessly perfect. So Jesus sent, so so God sent His perfect Son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place, the punishment for our sins, where He was nailed to the cross, He was buried, and He rose again from the dead three days later. Later, and He offers eternal life to anyone who will simply believe on Him for it. You must place all your faith in what He did, though, and you can. It will not work if you try to. Uh, believe in Jesus but also get water baptized to go to heaven or believe in Jesus but also repent of your sins to go to heaven if you try to add anything to a simple childlike trust in this saving message it won't work okay brother thank you very much I want to ask brother Eric if there's anything he wants to, to add to that or uh, elaborate any any at all no, I, th I think uh, Jackson put it beautifully. I think um, you know we talk a lot about um, what Christ did, uh, his suffering, um, the propitiation he made for, on our behalf. Um, everything Jackson said was was great, perfect. Um, you know this time, this uh, this day, you know we remember Christ's resurrection, and that's what it's really all about. You know the resurrection is the completion. Um, the the uh, the completion of all those things, the fulfilling of all those things, and him showing victory over death. That death no longer has that hold for us. That as a result of what he did for us and our complete and total trust in that, we never we now have the ability to go to this wonderful place that we're talking about. This place where God dwells. This place where, you know, we will never know the kind of uh, uh, issues that we deal with on earth. We'll, we'll never know the pains and the sorrows and the sufferings and the sickness. We'll, we'll, we'll never know these things again. Um, that's a wonderful thing. And, and not only that, we'll share that with each other. And that's something to be excited about. And really, all you need to do is trust in Christ. Are you really going to pass up on something so simple, so easy, that's right there before you? I mean... Seems like such an easy thing to do. Why pass up on it? Amen. Uh, all I would add before we end is that um, uh, on all of the videos of my channel, uh, in the description section, I post uh, my own statement of faith, uh, the core doctrines that, uh, that I believe and promote. Uh, and the one thing I want everybody to understand is that Jesus Christ is not merely a prophet or an angel or a, um, a great moral teacher. Uh, Jesus Christ is God Almighty uh, who decided to become a man for our benefit. He said that he, he did it so that he could die for our sins. And he was faithful. He died for our sins. So now sin is not a barrier between man and God. He proved that he is God and he paid for our sins because he raised himself from the dead as a sign to show he really is God and Savior. So I'm asking you now to uh, believe Jesus is this God Almighty, this Savior. Uh, believe that, that salvation is a free gift that he's offering you, and it's through faith alone in Christ alone. That simply means that you are no longer putting any faith in yourself. You've got to totally disregard that as, as, a, as a possibility, as an option, as, in, as a contributing factor to your salvation. No longer put any faith at all in yourself and say, I, I am instead putting my faith completely in this person, Jesus Christ, God Almighty, my Savior. 
But if you put your faith completely in him, that's when he gives you eternal life. And then understand that once he gives you eternal life, you're born again as a child of God, and you're a new creature, and you will never become unborn again. No matter what you do for the rest of your life, you can never lose your salvation for any reason. So those are the, the core beliefs that, uh, that uh, I, I'm promoting and that I hope that you will understand uh, through these teachings. So if you do put your faith in our great Savior God, Jesus Christ, today, please make a comment on this video, and uh, we, will, uh, we would love to know about it and celebrate. So uh, we'll end the show for today. We'll, we'll be on the same time uh, next week, next Sunday. Uh, hope you can join us. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.